Dire Team Ban. What's cracking, ladies and gentlemen? 49 coming at you with another community showcast for the UGC Dota League Season 2. We're loading into game number 2 of the Eastern Invite between Team Joey as well as Slaymakers. Joey were able to take a very convincing game number 1, utilizing a very 6.8 one drop. Uh, centered around the center of Warrior as well Rated as the Team Ban. They did opt to go for the offlane uh, Timbersaw, but he wasn't actually fairly effective in the, in the early stage of the game. It was mostly a Necotic with a standout performance over that Death Prophet, able to control the tempo of the game. Slaymakers, they decided to go for a uh, heroes have been opened up by A2, so they decided to go for the four positions fed. Going to be played by Gwyphon, as well as the uh, three position Legion Commander, as they use it to safely farm in the aggressive train lane. Unfortunately, the supports weren't able to find any kills in the early stage of the game. And because they actually were so far behind, because Fen is a melee Ten hero, seconds remaining. and it's a fairly ineffective support to it compared to something like a SD Lashrak, Five seconds or an SD Mirana, it became very difficult for them to try to recover, especially when you're fighting against the Timbersaw and Reserve against time. the Death Prophet. Melee here is an incredibly difficult time, because you're going to be walking Radiant into the Whirling Death as well as the Exorcism every single time. And so Joey opting to ban the Terror Blade first once again. Terror Blade has been introduced to Crafton's mode with A2, but he has been nerfed in regards to his playstyle. Split pushing no longer is as powerful a gameplay factor as it was in the earlier patches because every single time you take a tier 1 tower, you get a free fortification. So it means it's much more difficult for you to successfully take down multiple towers because it gives the enemy team a lot more time to respond to this. In Terror Blade, the hero con is structured completely around split pushing because he does it faster than almost any other hero, with the exception of maybe Lycan Throw. Into a Terror Blade. Ten seconds remaining. He's picked up because he provides a massive amount of team fighting presence and because he actually can man fight quite effectively, especially with the cast point buff over on Sunday. So 0 0.35 compared to 0.5, which it was uh, prior, so it means that he's much more effective being going for these early trades. We've got a Death Prophet from Doom Ring Band coming up for Slaymakers, and I'm loving this first pick. Ogre Magi has actually been significantly buffed. I'm actually going to go as far as to say that he's probably going to be one of the strongest support heroes, or even potential offlane heroes, in 8 2. So if buffed is. A uh, base HP regen from a uh, 0.2 to 2.5, so he's in the same club now as Nyx Assassin as well as Axe. Heroes that have higher than average uh, base HP regen. The reason why this is significant is Ogre Magi starts the game at 7 armor. Ten so he's got the single really. highest EHP of any hero at level 1 in the entire game, Die including Spirit picks. Breaker as well as Faces Void with Poor Man's Shield and Backtrack level. Ogre Magi is simply just too dumb to feel pain, and because he has 7 base armor, Die he's a able man. to shrug off right clicks like they were, can't, like they were nothing, and he's got enough HP regen that he can sit in lane even with just a single set of tangos. And so it makes him very powerful as an offlane hero. Also means that Soul Ring now is incredibly viable over in the Ogre, Ogre Magi, and Soul Ring provides him that burst mana for him to just sustain his spell use in the early stage of the game. Ogre Magi also has received a significant buff the way a multi works. Five seconds remaining. And so while Fire Blast does do 20 less damage, across all levels, 20 or 30, I'll have to double check on that one. It, it's time. the fact that Multicast now has a 40% chance at level 1, and because it's pseudo-random, Ogre Magi, you're guaranteed to get a uh, one Multicast off at least every two uh, Fire Blasts, and so it drastically increases the amount of damage you deal, also increases the amount of uh, crowd control, as it increased the interval between Multicast mm -hmm. by an extra 0.3 seconds, and so getting hit by a 4x Multicast has done for a lot bad. longer. Legion Commander is the third band coming up from Joey, so while Legion Commander wasn't used to great success by Slaymakers because that tri lane was so heavily shut down, still is an incredibly powerful hero, because Dyer, similar to a life ceiling, if you get an early lead with her, you can run away with that and snowball out of control, simply because the fact that every single kill gives you a more passive damage through a duel, and because you've got that lockdown coming from duel for the rest of your team to set up around. <coughs> So it looks like we've got an Ember Spirit uh, band coming out from Slaymakers. Ember Spirit's another hero that's incredibly powerful in A2. Because of the fact that you now are guaranteed a rune at, at both spots every two minutes. And Ember Spirit, he's one of the few heroes that can actually grab both runes at once. You drop a remnant, pick Radiant up the other rune, ban. zip back to the room and immediately pick that one up. If no one decides to contest it. If they do contest, then you get a rune charge. Because Ember Spirit is so efficient with the bottle, since he could drop a remnant, TP back up to refill his bottle charge. Having a guaranteed bottle refill every two minutes, assuming that your supports are able to camp the rune for you. Or be there to provide ward coverage. Ten seconds means remaining. Ember Spirit's able to stay in lane for a lot longer, drastically increases early ganking and team fight capability. Seconds because remaining. he's a hero that stays at the periphery of a fight. When they hang back, throw the Slater Fist, never Radiant directly engage peak. until you know that they can't fight you at all. And so now we've got a Razor Band coming up for Slaymakers as well as a Troll Warlord. Troll Warlord, he's a hero that actually, I believe he did receive a slight buff in the recent patch. I think they increased the AoE of the Welling uh, Axes. Overall, as a hero, his biggest strength is the fact that he functions incredibly well in the pushing lineup, or in a lineup where you've got multiple cores. 
In this case, because you've got the Centaur and the Invoker, popping the Battletrons makes you smack down towers incredibly quickly, especially if Invoker's going to go for Cross Exalt. will be interesting to see if Joey decides to go for the mid lane Invoker, or if they decide to run Radiant the safe lane Invoker. Pick. Now we've got the Faces Void pickup carrying off the Slaymakers, and so we've got the uh, Faces Void with the Skywrath combination. So most likely going to be Ogre Magi and Skywrath Mage, going to be the 4 and the 5 respectively. Ogre Magi also can be run as a 3. But Faces Void traditionally is run that 3 position hero because of the fact that all he needs is to hit level 6 to be effective. Because you've got so much killing power coming in from the time lock, Faces Void is absolutely ridiculous if you're able to find even a small amount of experience in the offlane. Just because if you've got heroes that can guarantee kill you kills inside the Chronosphere, in this case you've got the Skywrath Mage with the Mystic Flare, as well as the Ogre Magi to follow up with the Ignite Fire, Fire Blast. It means that every single time Chronos face off cooldown, if you capture a single target, they're dead. So long as you've got the Skyrath Mage with you, and if you're able to farm a, a Mask of Madness, which is actually cheaper in this patch by 100 gold, if you max out Time Lock, you go and pop the Chronos Fair, pop your Mask of Madness, that should be able to guarantee you a kill on most heroes over in Joey. Maybe the exception of the Centaur Warren, if you can capture the Invoker, the AA, or the ES, should be able to find some easy gold from that, and that's how Faces Void recovers. They've actually opted to pick up Weaver, as what looks like that one position here, and Weaver has been fairly buffed in A2, the fact that Gemini attack now can proc unique attack Ten seconds remaining. And so it means that Weaver going for something like a Maelstrom actually can be quite dangerous. Or even Five opting for something like an MKB, you now, or a crit, you now can proc that crit on the Gemini attack, so it drastically Reserve increases Weaver's time. DPS. But the drawback of Weaver is he's a fairly short range uh, range theory compared to heroes like the Adra Ranger or the Luna, and so since Luna can simply pop the Eclipse, Face of the Void can be very difficult for Weaver to be able to navigate these fights with the Corinthian Sphere there, so the advantage of this, however, is the fact that Void locks down a few heroes, Weaver runs down the others. And while you're Ten busy focusing on the Void, you don't uh, focus on the Weaver, so Weavers are the run around uncontested. Radiant however, at the same pick. time, unless a Void's really good with his Corinthian Sphere, it could be difficult. He might actually block out Weaver from being able to throw out right clicks. And so now we've got a Zeus Band coming out from Joey, as well as the Wraith King. Zeus actually has been buffed fairly significantly in this patch. Firstly, with the, with the rework of Bloodseeker, if you haven't seen the video, go on uh, YouTube, type in, I think it's something like, you can't run from bloody heaven, Blood Rage Zeus, with the Refresher Orb, Instant Rampage. Ten He's got seconds a 40% damage amp. Even without that, you've got the fact that Static uh, Field, the AoE has been increased, Five seconds and so remaining. Static Field's the ability that makes Zeus exceptionally powerful, even as a, in that support position role, or Reserve time. would have been a core position role, because the fact that... Every single time you throw out that arc lane, they're losing a percentage of their current HP pool, so Zeus just has to stay alive to be able to deal massive amounts of damage to his team. So long as he's alive and has mana, he's able to pick up something like Arcane Boots as well as a Blink Dagger, he can hang back in these fights, constantly throw out his abilities, deal huge amounts of damage, especially now that uh, you can blind fire the Thunderbolt, so you can use it to reveal invisible units as well as D-Ward. Zeus has become a significantly powerful hero, especially when you've got the setup already coming in, with the Faces Void to create you that space for you to call down the Thunder, as well as the Skywrath Mage uh, Ancient Seal to be able to amplify. And once again, Slaymakers banning out that Wraith King. Really aren't a fan of the uh, Wraith King in that one position role because of how durable he is. The biggest weakness of the Wraith King is the fact that he's very slow. Until he picks up that Blink Dagger, he's got no real way to close the distance. And he's completely dependent on his mana pool. And with the fact that Reincarnate now costs 20 mana, he has received a slight nerf. But that nerf is predominantly for Wraith Kings in that four position role. But the nice thing about the Wraith King is he will eventually reach a point of critical mass where he's so tanky you have to uh, kill him because otherwise he'll run over the rest of your team. But at the same time, Dyer, he, he's so tanky that you actually can't kill him twice. <coughs> so he eventually is just able to run over the rest of your team. And Slaymakers do go for the Kunkka. And Kunkka works exceptionally well with the face of the Void. You throw out the Chronosphere, throw out the boat, and even if for whatever reason the boat completely whiffs, the fact that you're providing that 50% uh, damage reduction buff through the Coco run for the rest of your team means that you're able to stay alive in these engagements a lot longer, and when you've got a lot of sustained damage coming in from the Ogre, the Skywrath, and the Weaver, and that could turn these fights in your favor. So we're actually going to Meepo pick up coming in from Origins. May you be remembered. So it looks like we could be seeing what looks like perhaps a safe lane Invoker with a mid lane Meepo, or they could actually opt to go for a tri lane Meepo with a mid lane Invoker. Either option is viable. Nicotic was the mid player in the last game, and he's going to be the Invoker, so this time he's going to be flexing his wings. Did criticize the mid lane invoker coming out from Slaymakers because he is a very greedy mid here, and I do stand by that. The only caveat, of course, is if you've got an exceptionally skilled mid lane uh, invoker player. But in that case, the point becomes moot. In a skill vacuum, assuming uh, both players are of equal skill and there's no rotations coming in, invoker does lose a fair amount of matchups simply because he doesn't have that lane control from the very Ten beginning. Ten seconds remaining. But against a hero like what looks like a Kunkka, could be fairly interesting since Five invoker can simply just throw remaining. out right clicks in the Kunkka and try to harass him back. Kunko, of course, if he opts to go for the Tidebringer at once, should actually be able to uh, out-CS the Invoker in the early stage of the game, but while I say that, 
Gonna be quickly introducing the players from both teams. Over on Team Joe, Nicotic once again. For battle. Standing for the team, gonna be the mid lane invoker. Actually buying his own tangos this time, so not asking the sports to pull them. And so they're running in. Looks like he's gonna pull them some anyway. Never mind, just backs off. Megalomania, the captain, gonna be the 5 position Earthshaker. Sidhu is gonna be the 4 position Ancient Apparition. <coughs> Pardon me. Or at least Megalomania will be the 4 position until he picks up that Blink Dagger. In which case, he'll revert to the 5. And Blink Dagger on ES is absolutely critical. Lentith gonna be the Centaur Warrener. It looks like we could be seeing what looks like dual lanes. So in this case, the Centaur Warrener is there to bodyguard Lentith to make sure that he's... They can't actually dive to go for any kills on him. And the biggest weakness in the Warrener is a fairly greedy offlane hero. You want to get a very early Blink Dagger for him to be relevant. And he doesn't really do well if here. enemy heroes decide to just go ham and dive him. Especially seconds to battle. as his Hoopstop mana has increased. Oranges gonna be what looks like a safe lane. Uh, Meepo going up against Monty. Monty, he's... Seeing this before, decides to start smacking up oranges. And Monty, actually not going for a stealth shield, this could be a huge mistake, especially as that uh, offlane void going for a quelling blade, when you've got no one to support you, means you're going to be eating a huge amount of damage. And so far, Slaymakers, they're the ones going to be gunning the runes, so over for the that, they're mid players. For good and all. Damian going to be what looks like the 4 position uh, Ogre Magi. Splicidu going to be the 5 position Skywrath, although both can be switched around. And we're going to be seeing Cassius Clay going to be the one position once again. So we've got a little bit of an unconventional uh, offlane safety warp in place. So this provides vision of these two uh, ganking pathways. This is incredibly important now that you now have uh, these walkways to go through as well. Although that being said, the offlane can also hide here. Have vision of this area and decide to back himself off when he sees them coming in. And so we're going to be seeing a tri-lane coming out from uh, Joey. It looks like Megalomaniel is just there to actually creep block. So he's just going to completely rotate all the way top. So is that a bit of provided much support as possible at level 1 to Lenti by ensuring that he's able to pick up level 2. Unless if Cassius Clay is able to deny every single creep, Lenti, just through a sheer EXP, a passive EXP again, even if he's not able to find any last hits, should be able to pick up level 2, and that makes him a lot more threatening. Because now that they decide to dive him, he's got that hoof stop double edge to at least get a trade. Orange has actually opted for poof at 1, you usually see Earthbind at 1. But the advantage of poof is the fact that if he's left alone against Void, he can contest for CS, because he'll simply start poofing. Faces Void's forced to back off, otherwise he's going to eat the damage. It makes it a lot more effective for you to go in for a last hit. And also means that Meepo, at level uh, 2, if he holds on to a skill point, he waits until level 3. And, and for when he gets Divided We Stand, he then has 2 points of poof. So it gives him a 200 uh, magic damage burst combo at level 3. Which you can use to threaten for a kill, especially with the F Fish of the Sedma. Nicolic over in the mid lane. Actually, a lot more even matchup this time against the Squirtle, because the Squirtle's got that base damage from the Tide Hunter, from the uh, Tidebringer, sorry, looks like he actually is opting to max out Torrent, at least with early two po early points in Torrent, so we'll be interesting to see if he decides to go in for two points in X now to guarantee the Torrent, which is the conventional Kunkka build, or if he decides to go for much more of a pub build and just opt to max out either the Torrent or the Tidebringer. Let me take a quick break to blow my nose real quick, I do apologize. Well, I say that, Gwyphon eats a Hoofstomp, Lent Teeth. Does have the it actually opted not to go for a double edge, went for a return instead. Bit surprising he went for that point in return, considering the fact that the majority of the harassment damage is gonna be coming in from uh, the arcane bolt. <coughs> but the double edge can use you can use it to threaten the kill. Or at least to prevent them from diving you. So the return doesn't stop you from being dived. A squad, there we go. He's gonna be going from conventional conquer build to two points over the X. Guarantees him being able to set it up over on the codic. And the Squirtle actually is should be able to threaten to kill at level 5 or even at level 6. And the alternative build for the Kunker, at least in the competitive scene, is you actually go for 3 points in X, and the rationale for it is a guarantee to the boat. So Squirtle. He's threatening Nicotic, hasn't landed the torrent so far, but he's using them to create space. Nicotic opted for a very early uh, Ring of Basilius. It's a bit of an unconventional pickup over the Invoker. The nice thing about it is you can use it to push out the Creep Wave. So you can use it to uh, try to contest runes by pushing out the wave. So that the enemy hero is forced to fight their creeps at that tower where you go for runes. But against the Kunker, not going to be as effective. The nice thing about this as well is if he is going to be going for the zoo build, which he might be. The double fort spirits as well as the Necronomicon. Having the uh, armor aura is going to be quite effective. And the fact that Basilius has been buffed since Ring of Protection now provides 3 armor as opposed to 2. Cassius Clay. So far, early boots pick up on him. Not, not a nice thing about the Weaver that I failed to mention before no. during the draft is the fact that Swarm lasts for an extra 4 seconds at level 1. That provides you a huge increase in killing power, especially if he opts to prioritize Swarm over Geminate. 
into Weaver. He's a hero that's incredibly powerful for the first 15 minutes just off his abilities. So even without items he's able to threaten kills, and with items he becomes even more dangerous. Megalomania does scout out Damio. Ping's coming up from him. And Lenti. He knows that he can play very far forward, but while he's saying that, Monty actually finds first blood over in Sirius. But Gryphon could be taking four oranges. The Meepos are there, actually creeps able to bring him down. Monty salving, but caught between oranges and another orange. So an orange in a hard place. Earthbind coming off cooldown fairly shortly. The other Meepo completely out of money. Poofing to that Meepo. Good micro coming up from oranges, but oranges no mana available. Unfortunately, not going to be enough, especially with Daymouth running the TP. And so once again, I'm having a little bit of lag. Hopefully, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. And Ogre Magi opted to prioritize two points in uh, Ignite early on. This is a much more effective DPS build. Since you have to max out Fire Blast now that uh, with the rework to the damage as well as with the rework to multicast, it's now being buffed. But you want the early points in. <coughs> you want the early second point over in the Ignite for him to really uh, peak in terms of his damage capacity. Since Ogre Magi, once you pick up something in Soul Ring, every single time it's off cooldown, throw it at the carry or throw it at the offlane and deal a huge amount of casual harassment damage, you could really zone the heroes out quite effectively, especially if you follow up with a few right clicks. It's Ogre Magi, incredibly beefy, so he doesn't really care Denied. if he's going to be eating right clicks in return. Lenti put out with the Arcane Bolt as well as the Concussive Shot. Cassius Clay throws out a few cheeky right clicks, looks like he's actually going to be prioritizing generating attack. I do disagree with this build now that Swarm has been buffed so significantly. You should at least opt for one value point in it, then the off chance of going for a kill. But that being said, the nice thing about the extra points in Gemini Attack is it gives you a lot more lane control, so if he's not going to be going for any kills any soon, or going for any tower dives, go for the extra point Gemini Attack does help you farm faster and does help you harass the enemy hero out more. Monty with that kill, especially since first blood, doing very nicely for himself as that offlane void. And Sudo. They, ha they are actually able to pull back a fair amount of creeps, and the nice thing about the Mipo, Especially in that safe lane role, he's able to find a huge amount of golden experience. The fact that you could stack and clear out camps very easily. You've got that double or even triple poof. Give it a burst and another find a huge amount of flash farm. But because of the way comebacks work in regards to a golden experience, Meepo's actually a fairly bad hero in A2 just because he's going to get more gold and more experience than anybody else. Just by the sheer virtue of the hero. Having multiple Meepos in the team fight means that you actually take a disproportionate amount of experience for the rest of your team. So Meepo's going to get incredibly fat. And all you have to do then is just kill the fat hero and a huge amount of gold experience in return. So Oranges, any misplay coming up from him will be punished incredibly drastically. But that being said, the nice thing about the Meepo, and the reason why Meepo is picked up, is he power spikes like no other hero, just because he's able to find such a huge amount of gold experience in the early stages of the game, and because he's able to multiply that exponentially, if you get a good early game with Meepo, you can often end the game in the first 20 minutes. Just because he eventually reaches a point well, he's going to outfarm everybody else on the map. He's going to get so far he can't even kill the Meepos. And while I say that, Damian goes in on the Conic. X marks the spot as well as the turret and the Ghost Boat being used. The Conic runs forward, dodging the bone. Good recognition coming up from him. No boots, of, uh, just regular boots up on him. So no phase and the Squirtle smacks him down. So using Water Gun and following up with Water Blast is able, should, is able to cut down the Invokers. So it's super effective against Fire Types and Cassius play. Treads up on them. Probably going to be going for Lincoln's Fair, although with the Gemini attack, UAM change, could be seeing even something like an early Maelstrom over the Weaver to increase his flash farming capacity as well as his teamfight DPS. So it will be interesting to see what he actually decides to build. Could decide to simply stick to his guns and go for the traditional Lincoln's Fair or BKB rush. Call out with the Fishers, whilst the Hoofstomp, Hoofstomp just barely catches him as he's able to scooch you out. Time lapses, so it says. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Well the HP. It has no arms to defend itself. Damiel. Good looks to threaten the kill over Lenti, because he's actually too far forward. Damiel leads the charge with the Ignite. Arcane Bolt as well as the Ancient Seal being used as well as the Concussive Charm. One more right click and Gryphon able to find it. This time Slaymakers taking the initiative, taking these early fights. They know they've got the superior uh, support duo as the ES and the AA. Both very greedy support heroes, where the AA is incredibly greedy in the sense that he can, the only way he can play aggressively is if you have another aggressive ranged hero that can benefit from the cold, from the chilling touch. Yes. Earthshaker, he's there mostly as a roaming hero, or this kid's gonna be that bodyguard in the tower. Actually eats the uh, torrent. Squirtle could have chosen to commit that with the ghost boat. So the ghost boat's got a lot of cooldown, you can afford to throw it out, even if you're not able to get the kill. Not the end of the world, just because it has such a short cooldown. Actually only has one point in X, so Squirtle feeling fairly confident in his ability to be able to land that torrent is maxing out that torrent as well, so it provides you a huge amount of burst damage in the early stages. And the nice thing about this 
is the fact that you've got the Fire Blasters to set up for it. You even actually see him drop his bottle, give his bottle to Damiel so he can pick up that regen rune. It's a good recognition coming up for him, he just wants to sit in the mid lane, he knows he's at full HP and full mana, he doesn't really need it. So Damiel pops that regen rune, goes up to full, actually looks to max out the ignite. And so the nice thing about this is you a lot more overall DPS, but the drawback is you don't have that lockdown. Necrotic just barely hit. does take a fall to the Ogre Magi. Dot damage, Damian, though, gonna be the sacrificial map. As Orange is actually one of the backs off. Bit of miss micro coming out of the turret might be enough. Damian keeping himself alive from now by Squirtle. He's now at risk. He did the best that he could. Unfortunately, wasn't able to land that turret on the other two heroes. Megalomania. Picks up the kill, so he's a lot closer to his Arcane Boots. And once the Arcane Boots comes online, he can afford to spam out that Fissure. Be a lot more liberal with his uses. Squiddle. Animation cats on this turret there. Could have looked to go for it. Monty does have the Chronosphere. Tries actually not to commit it. Could have actually thrown out the Chronosphere even though he was Earthbind, as it doesn't prevent spell usage at all or prevent you from turning. Decided not to go for it. And the Squiddle will be interesting to see what item Kunkka chooses to go for. You used to see Shadowblade uh, picked up as the first core item over in Kunkka because of the fact that it would probably get out with the Tidebreaker to deal a huge amount of burst physical AoE attacked. damage to the enemy team. But that has actually fallen in the favor with the Shadow Blade nerf, so it does have a much longer cooldown. But with the fact that you now get 25 more damage when you break Shadow Blade, could be seeing it picked up more often over in Kunkka, as I believe that's a lot more effective in terms of a goal for DPS than the Chrysalis. Otherwise, you see the Chrysalis, so maybe something like a Blink Dagger or a Daedalus Rush. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Gwyphon, Magic Wand available. Holding on to his uh, Gold for now. Looks like he actually opted for a second point and. Uh, Ancient Seal as opposed to maxing out the uh, Arcane Bolt, you usually see Skyrath Rangers no either max out the Arcane Bolt or max out the Ancient Seal. It's gone for a bit of a hybrid build. In this case, the nice thing about it is you've got a lot more magic damage coming in from the Kunker, as well as from Damiel, so it actually does give you a fair amount of work. Whereas the second point, the Arcane Bolt's mostly there for the cooldown reduction. Would have preferred if he chose to prioritize one or the other, but with this particular matchup, because he's got the lineup that can kind of support going for this kind of hybrid build, it does make a fair amount of sense. And with the change to Concussive Shot, it actually is viable to max because of shot second world. after either the Ancient Seal or the Arcane, but while I say that, Cassie's play, Sunstrike is going to be the first off, so Stampede into Hoopstomp into what looks like a Fissure Sunstrike. A lot of damage being done by them. So a good pick off being used over in the one position. And Oranges, fortunately not able to land that Earthbind. So you opt for two points, and the Earthbind then priori start prioritizing the Geostrikes, that provides you a lot more overall DPS and a lot more compound engagements. So you only really need two points in Earthbind, you don't really need the extra our range compared to the dot damage you get from it, so you should be able to set up a very easy earth on around a squad. Unfortunately, whoops, Chaos Dunk is there. So the echo is being used as well as the Tyrant Ghost. Not going to be enough that the Ghost Point Lander might have actually been a find to kill over on Megalomania. But good recognition from Megalomania using the Aftershock uh, stun that you get from the uh, Echo Slam, the Echo Slam is zero cast attack. point, and so it guarantees you getting that zero point and nine second stun. And so that's set up for the uh, Cold Feet as well as the damage from that, meaning that uh, Orange is together right really to start the Geo Strike. It's so a good recognition to be able to set up that kill. Monty, Tret's picked up on him, actually looked to prioritize our time law. So you've got two builds over on the face of the void as far as the offlane ward is concerned. You either prioritize the uh, time lock to give you damage, or you prioritize time walk to give yourself initiation range. In this case, he knows that the rest of his team can provide the damage, so he just has to be there to set up the chronosphere. If you can get a long range chronosphere, initiation then with the time walks. So the second point time walk uh, means that you, you should be able to initiate from 900 raids, so you can actually initiate from a uh, fog a lot easier during night time. Especially since most heroes have about 800 night vision. Having 3 points means you've got about 1100 now, so you can initiate from much further back. So it gives you a lot more um, margin of error when you're committing to, to going for that Chronosphere. Makes it makes setting up the Chronosphere a lot easier. And because you've got so much wombo combo damage with the torrent into the Ghost Boat, it does make a fair middle sense. Tower is under attack. It's a casual Ice Blast. Ice Blast unfortunately whiffs the Sidhu. Able to find the creep from that, so not the complete end of the world for him, but Monty, just as a side step. Dyer's middle tower is that beat's been used over the bottom lane, they are looking for attacked. a kill. They do actually back themselves off. They went in for Cassius Clay, but it looks like he was able to juke him out. And Cassius Clay, still no points over in the swarm, looks like there is going to be a quick pause. I'm going to use that opportunity to take a quick look at Golden Spells experience. So 3,000 experience lead in favor of Team Joey. Mostly owing to the fact that they've got a lot more uh, last hits as well as nice, especially with the fact they've got a Meepo, so they're naturally going to get a lot more experience. And in terms of gold, actually fluctuating a lot more. This is a much closer to gold lead, so only 1,500 gold lead. This can be completely swung to either team's favor with a single kill with a single tower. So this is one of the nice things of 8-2, is the fact that it's much more uh, even in the sense that if you decide to you know, trade kills a lot more effectively, if you trade kills in fights, 
you're going to be able to maintain some kind of level and goal parity, whereas before, the team that was ahead would simply get further ahead. It would be much more difficult for you to really get ahead, for you to really uh, recover from a bad start. Onto Nikonic. Opt to go for uh, the 4 staffs. The nice thing about the 4 staff over in the Invoker, especially the plus Exalt Invoker, is it gives you the positioning that you need. Invoker with uh, maxed out Exalt hits like an absolute monster truck. And because you've got the double Forge Spirit, you've got a lot of lockdown coming in from the double Forge Spirit Cold Snap. And so having the 4 staff means that you can actually, uh, once you initiate them with the 4 Spirit as well as the Cold Snap, you 4 staff towards them, turn yourself around, and then drop the Ice Wall. While I say that, Damien, let's yeah, take a fall as oranges, and we'll smack him down. <coughs> so. Slight misfield coming in from there, but what? Well, so oranges just get cleaned up by Cassie's play. And the nice thing about maxing out Ignite is it's a lot more uh, mana efficient. So if you happen to be EXP stuff, it'll just give you a lot more bang for your buck. Mega Mania, let's take a fall to Cassie's play and you can find the double kill. The drawback to this build, however, is especially with the uh, rework to how Fire Blast works, and you no longer have as much damage coming in from the Fire Blast. Since Fire Blast scales fairly badly, it does scale a little bit better now, so, uh, so 60 oh, damage per level. For the radiant. You want the uh, level Dyer's full fire blast as soon as possible, attack. especially Run once the uh, multicast guns online, because that's where the vast majority of your burst damage can come in from. Will I say that, Nikolic? Doing the combo that I told you about. Double force spirits out the cold snap, force stuff yourself. Or use the ice force so they can't walk away, and you just smash them down. Cassie Clay looks like he's going to be going for that maelstrom, so it drastically increases your farming capacity. Will I say that, Quetel? Caught him by Origin with the earth bind, as the poop. Not even needed, just smacks him down. The ice blast flies over his corpse. Wife now rotating back in. Mystic Flare now is available. Looks like you actually opt to go for Tranquil Books, which attack. provides you a lot more roaming as well as a bit more maneuverability. In Sky Wrath Mage, you're not actually going to be throwing out right clicks and engagements, but you don't necessarily have to. By the gods, You've got long enough range, you have to set back and throw out those arcane balls. Cast his play with that Nelspot. Actually, becomes quite powerful as a split push. And while I say that, Lenteam catch him on the fantastic Boop Stop Fidget Double Edge in it. Combination. So good initiation coming in from Lenteam. The backup from Megalomania. Wife actually finds a kill over on. Uh, the Invoker, so Nicotic, a little bit far out of position. You're able to bring him down Damio. I mean, the nice thing about the Max Ignite build is it gives you more consistent overall DPS, but because it's much... You've got that 40% chance of multicast as opposed to 25%. You're going to get more overall DPS from Max Kill Fire Blast now, as well as a lot, a lot more burst damage, which Ignite doesn't really provide you. But the nice thing of Max Kill Ignite, though, is the fact that it gives you that increase in Snare. As well as the fact that it actually does deal a fairly substantial amount of damage on its own. So the increased snare in this case, because you've got so much follow-up. For the turret that actually lands over Megalomania. From the Kunker as well as the face of Void and the Weaver. You don't necessarily need burst damage yourself. You've got that from the rest of your team. So SM, the draft days with the way that their skill builds are going, they're going from teamfight oriented abilities. With the exception of Cassie's players, only now just picked up a point over the swarm. Well, I say that, Gwyphon just get taken out by Oranges. Into that direct last blast to catch over Monty, but the medium backtracks there. And so the nice thing about the Max Gemini attack build is because you went for the Maelstrom, increases your likelihood of the Maelstrom proccing. And Maelstrom, it doesn't seem like it does a lot of damage, but the fact that you're dealing it to multiple heroes, it doesn't necessarily matter what hero you jump, you're able to deal damage to their frontline and their backline at the same time. And it does help the split push and farm a lot faster, can be quite critical of a difference. Meepo now does pick up the Invis room. Tower so one of the Meepos attack. is going to be scanning around the map, so he's doubling Dyer's back now for the Agnum Scepter. So the Blink Dagger is going to provide you for a, a very aggressive uh, early game build for the Meepo. So you chain up the poofs, blink it with the main Meepo and throw out the Earthbind. The other Meepos immediately poof in. That's enough burst damage to actually instantly kill a hero like Wyphon. By the gods, the Dyer's bottom tower doesn't even have arms to defend itself. So he's continuing to go for this a split tower. build. Go for both Arcane Bolt as well as the Ancient Seal. And it has been working out for him fairly effectively. He's actually gone to the third of his team's kills so far. And Oranges, Invisor is about to wear off. He knows that uh, SM are playing fairly passive and grouping together. About time. And it looks like a Swirl is going to be going for the early drops of Endurance. It provides you a lot more teamfight impact. And so SM, because they've got such an Radius insane amount of teamfight damage in lockdown, if they get their combo right, they're building entirely for teamfights. They know that if they get one big teamfight, they can use that to try to take towers, use that to try to uh, turn... The game give himself, put themselves in a good enough position they can take it to the later stages of the game. Because when it comes to late game, they actually do have the superior late game lineup since Meepo, by virtue of his hero, because he's going to hit level 25 so much faster than every other hero, so long as you're able to consistently kill Meepo or even occasionally pick him off, you get a massive amount of gold experience from that. So Joey actually has the inferior late game lineup as a result Radiance of that. Middle tower has fallen. Cassie's play. Sakushi through Lenti. The Lightning Fox is already right here. Oh, it's going to cancel. He does have Blink Dagger available, so he should be able to use it to get himself out of position. Monty pops the Mask of Madness, Montezuma's out for blood. 
Just like in Civilization. Fortunately, Whips of the Time Walk does spot out Lentif. Lentif says hello. Catching off the hoof stops. This is me you're looking for. Backtracks there are a Monty, but Monty of the Mask of Madness loses almost all his life from one sun strike. Lentif tries to himself to the wolves. And Monty gets poked apart like the oranges. Cassie's clear. Jukes left. Jukes right. Looks like sentries have been dropped. Tower Both is coming into Orange actually takes the balls, Cassie's man tucks him down with that time lapse, and Dame Yao pops ancient right apparition, so it's a song of ice and fire as he blows him up in what looks like a multicast. <coughs> an invoker, Nectonic. He was able to uh, participate at least by that retaliatory kill with that sunstrike, but unfortunately not gonna be enough. It was too late to get into the fight, he's now doubled back to going for the zoo build. And so having the four staff means you can set up the ice wall, so it gives you an illusion. Your, uh, sorry, your minions as well as your forward spirits, a lot more time to be able to beat them down. So it makes a huge amount of sense with the Quasar Exor build. And so now going to the second attack. It has not long to defend itself. Because you've got a guarantee, uh, you've got a reliable way for your minions to do damage. Megalomania has to be careful with Monty. Wanted to go for the Quasar Fantasy side, maybe holding onto it for now. Megalomania, great reaction with that Echo Slam. Monty's not to commit for it. Torrent's also there. So it looks like a Squirtle kind of wanted to take that kill. Birth is a promise. Monty able to secure it. So this is the first successful Protosphere he's had in the first 18 minutes. He might have actually had one earlier when he wasn't able to see, but this is the first I've caught on camera. And so with that, Monty is able to recover fairly nicely. He does have that level 2 Protosphere now, as well as that maxed out time lock. And so this is the damage combination of the Faces Void for the first 20 minutes with no items, just with uh, maxed out time lock and with the uh, Master Madness, you're able to deal a fair amount of damage. So with no other DPS item, just the Master Madness, because of how much damage time lock deals with the Spirit, you find a solo pick off. That wispy glow now against the Slider, you might look to pick up something like a BKB, to completely mitigate the vast majority of uh, Joey's damage. At least in the early stages of the fight, they do have the right coming up with Orange, and actually does stack up quite heavily. But predominantly the damage can be coming in from the pure damage from the Sunstrike, Chaos Meat, and then the magic damage from the Chaos Meat and the food. As well as the Echo Slam. Dame Yell actually opting for an early point over in the uh, Bloodlust. So he realizes that he's not going to be finding a lot of levels early on. So the nice thing about this is very uh, EXP efficient. Because it means that he's not dependent on being going to get that level 2 uh, multicast for it to be effective. And so he's using Fire Blast primarily for the uh, CC as opposed to the potential burst damage. And with the change to the multicast, it actually is fairly reliable. You can almost consider it a two second stun. Megalomania doesn't get caught out with the first hit time lock, and so it's not going to be able to get any of his abilities off in time since Earthshaker, unfortunately, 0.54 cast point. Looks like I actually was able to get off the enchant totem, but Monty should be the running down. Sunstrike's flying through to actually threaten Monty. Turns his ground, and with the mask of madness pop, Monty takes a fair amount of damage. The jukes are coming in from Megalomania, still keeping himself alive. Somebody call Ike's Mike for these plays. Lenty really actually comes in and cleans them up. Great plays coming in from Joey. As Monty, he really wanted that kill, unfortunately. Joey said no. Radiance Middle Tower is Cassius attack. now going in for the BKB, That's so he realizes that the majority of Joey's damage is going to be magic damage, so getting that early BKB means that he can stand his ground, throw a massive amount of damage with those right clicks, especially with the double chance to effectively proc the Maelstrom. As we saw in that early engagement, he simply time lapsed, stood his ground against, I believe it was the uh, Center Warren and brought him down fairly quickly. A Squirtle now going in for the Chrysalis, so no Shadow Blade needed. The nice thing about this is if you do get a crit, it deals it an, absolute, an absolutely obscene amount of damage to these engagements, especially since you've got that window with the Chronosphere to set up the Ghost Boat and the Torrent. So you're going to get Radiant's multiple hits off, you might actually get a attack. second Tidebringer hit in. So even if your first isn't crit, if you're lucky, the second crit might be enough. As well as the overall DPS you get from the Chrysalis, it gives you a lot more farm efficiency than the Shadow Blade, so you forward. don't have to pop the Shadow Blade every single time to go for creeps. It will be interesting to see if he decides to go and complete this with Vendus, or if he decides to opt in for the Blink Dagger. Well, I say that, Monty well, caught out once again the Blink Initiation coming from Lenti, because there's Oranges, Megalomania is there, catches out uh, Gryphon, the Echo Slam as well as the Fisher, punches him down, Ghost Boat now flies, catches out too. Look at Magi, takes the balls, Dave Yell, Meow's no more, Squirtle caught him with the Earth Bond, Cassie Clay comes up, and Lenti comes up once again with the Hoof Star double edge combination. Cassie Clay invisible is able to time lapse himself out, and Oranges is going to be very careful now. He cannot afford to die in this engagement. So go back in for Cassius Clay, Megalo Mania comes in, double edge, not gonna be there since Kuchi is able to keep himself alive for now. Cassius Clay turns over Megalo Mania, a little bit too greedy, and Invoker just smacks himself the whole time. Orange just comes in, not able to find the hero, but finds a creep instead. And Torrent unfortunately whips on the creep flame, used just to try to bite the tongue. If Cassius had the uh, BKB in that engagement, 
he would have not only survived, but he would have ensured that the that Slaymakers were going to find a few more kills. Radiant's top tower the early BKB attack. against the magic damage uh, reliant lineup like Joey. As look at that Harwick and Biggins and the Ford Spirits are going to be able to take that tail one tower, at least forced to die. Double damage. Looks like Skyrath is able to die, so Gwyfum is able to force him. Multicast, so Tamiyao is able to find 150 gold, so it makes up for the gold he lost by dying. Now doubling back to going for the Fire Blast. So the early point and Ignite is a value point, so they, since the uh, Bloodlust story does give you that 10% movement speed, which can be quite critical and slow here like the Ogre Magi. Megalomania. Farming up creeps, he does have his Blink Dagger now. Was actually able to use that to great success in that last engagement. And so now we've got Boots of Travels available for Meepo, and this is an absolutely fantastic Boots pickup since Boots of Travels has been buffed now to 50 second cooldown as opposed to 60. The fact that every single Meepo can now BOT anywhere across the map. So the split push is real from the Meepo, you can now teleport anywhere to help out the rest of your team, and it drastically increases your farming speed. If you decide to play a Meepo at that one position role, which he naturally is so well suited for. So Joey, while they do have the inferior uh, lineup, late game lineup, because if Meepo does die, he feeds such an obscene amount of golden experience. They can simply decide to play it safe, get him so far that it's impossible for him to die. Even if, or if he does die, it's, it's going to force him to use everything they have on him. They call it caught out with the target. Whilst the Echo Step coming here from Megalomania, Tony is actually alive for now. Cassie's Clay is able to stand his ground, let's take off one. Megalomania still set his ground, let's bring down Gwyph and Cassie's Clay, back himself off, the double edge is there, unfortunately not even get the time lapse off. And AA brings him down. So I get one kill on the Evoker from what looks like the Nostrum Proc in exchange for four huge trade going in favor of Joey. And from the use of, of their ultimates coming in from uh, Slaymakers, the only ultimate they have that can really help them win this next engagement is going to be that Chronos Fair. Ghost Bill will be coming up for really the had used it just had a short cooldown to begin with. But Orange is already threatening that tattoo. Fortification is up on the Radiant side. They have been fairly uh, miserly with their fortification because you now get a free attack. fortification That's every single time a tier 1 falls. It's worth it to use a fortification to delay a push the tier 1 tower every single time. Because you're going to be getting it back off cooldown for free anyway. Radiant's middle tower is Lenti, MVP for his team, really been setting up these ganks with machine like precision, setting up the uh, hoops off double edge. Orange is actually one of the ages, so it could be a turnaround. Four staff being used tactically. Looks like Lenti was the one that actually forced off his teammate out to safety, so Orange is just barely able to keep himself alive. There's a double uh, uh, multicast was actually coming out from Damian. And Damian going for his own four staff. Just doing anything he can to stay relevant in this game. The nice thing about the Arcane Boots, this is Ogre Magi, the mana cost for Fire Blast actually increases uh, with points over the multicast. It's another reason to actually avoid scaling up uh, Fire Blast and maxing out the Ignite instead. As Ignite has a, a much more lower cooldown with more points in the multicast than the Fire Blast. It's a lot more mana efficient, but then they're rotating over to Roshan. Orange might actually look to maybe go for something of Vladimir's offering since Roshan. This slab now does an obscene amount of damage, so you actually have to be fairly careful. Then TP is the one tanking it up. We'll be interesting to see what enemy choose to go for next. Traditionally, Centaur Warrior goes for something like Shiva's Guard because you don't have to build HP on the Centaur Warrior. You have all the HP in the world from your passive stack here, so increasing your EHP instead by going for armor. Boost your survivability in these team fights means you can absorb a lot more right clicks. You're returning a lot more damage, even though you don't have as much strength to work around with. Shiny. Compared to if you went for something like a Hana Tarask. It also gives you the snare from the Shiva's Guard, which is absolutely critical. Since you're going to be blinking into their entire team, starting a team fight off with half their team, or even their entire team called into the snare, could spell doom, especially when you've got the blink uh, poof coming in from uh, oranges, as well as the chaos dunk coming in from the Earth Jager. Glenty. Goes over and creeps inside the Mud Golems. Goes instead over to the Alpha Wolves. He's got Return. Almost maxed out, so he should be able to smack him down quite easily. Center Warren is a fairly efficient jungling hero. Just because he's able to uh, farm up qu fairly quickly with Return as well. So the Hoof Stop Double Edge. Concussive Chopper and Yuzo in the corner. He's got a lot of on him. Four stops himself and immediately Ghost Walks. So even though he's just barely walking along, actually being a little bit cocky there. Cassie's Clay still is in the neighborhood. BKB's not flying into him. And Gwyphon, utilizing the new gank pathway. Could actually look to threaten the kill over in the Necotic, but Megalomania is now coming in. The smoke rotation coming in from Joey. They want to end this game. And the best way to do that is by finding a pick off. Smoke has been revealed, Lenti. Gonna be designed to pop his uh, stampede. Actually, something hold on to it for now. Now it's nice to pop his stampede. Mate now, Damiel actually dies to the uh, what looks like the ancient apparition ice blast. Megalomania taking a huge amount of damage. Cold down with the air. A Chronos Fan, so no echo slime coming up from him. Orange is actually locked in place as well, so Monty's man to smack him down with a cold feet. Uh, touch is there, as well as the chilling touch. Orange just does die, but that's an Aegis kill. 
doesn't feed the gold experience. And S ends up backing themselves off. They were able to find one kill left. Unfortunately, not able to get that uh, hoop stop. Goes up for a double edge instead of a Gwyphon. And Gwyphon is barely keeping himself alive. Time lapse being used over Cassie's Clay. Meatball flies on top of him. And the Chronic says Mob Spaghetti brings him down with that. And with that kill, it should be the threat of the Tattoo Two Towers. As there's no buyback available for the important for uh, all three cores of SM, the only one that can buy back is the Cooker. And he alone can't hold this, especially like uh, even with the Ghost Boat. All he can really do is buy some time. And with the Chronosphere committed, unfortunately not able to uh, find an effective Radius kill, they were able to burn off the Aegis, as well as find a kill over on the Earthshaker. They were at least able to prevent the uh, Echo Slam. The Echo Slam flew out, could have been an absolute Radius disaster, or at least fallen, even more so. And, I don't mean in love. and with that kill, they are continuing to threaten. Tier 3 now, so they're trying to breach high ground. They've got at least a 25 second window if they decide to commit for this. They know they don't have a Chronosphere, but they don't want to walk into the boat. They're going to play it safe because they know that they're throwing away any kills, especially in this stage of the game, we're so far ahead. It's going to spell out for the doom. So once again, 14,000 uh, experience lineup in favor of Joey, and 12,000 gold. So off to a great start, Oranges. Only a fantastic amount of farm, level 20 up on them compared to the levels over on the radiant side. So if, for instance, if Gwyphon is able to kill Oranges, he'll actually gain, I believe, three or four levels with the rest of his team. If he's able to kill him with uh, just one hero there. Squirtle, caught out of position by Lentif, so Megalomania, great fishing ball coming in from him. The follow-up hoop stop. On the BOTs, Orange is immediately able to come in to help. Mech now picked up over the Skyrath Mage, but of course the biggest drawback of this is since Mech now costs such a huge amount of mana, it means that he can Mech throw out an uh, concussive shot and the Mystic Flare, and he's got enough mana for, uh, for one uh, uh, Arcade Ball and Ancient Seal. So it means he no longer has enough mana to work around with. And so you actually might have considered even holding off the second skill point in the Mystic Flare. Since the damage increase is nice, but if you don't have enough mana to throw out Arcane Bolt as well, it actually leads to less overall DPS and, te and prolonged team fights. But Gwyphon could just be banking on the burst damage, with the Mystic Flare being enough to be able to ensure a kill. Then Teeth eats that Ignite, and this is the added benefit of maxing out that Ignite, is its ability to be the disruptor to the Blink Dagger. Oh, he said that Megalomania comes with a huge Echo Slam, they immediately pick off two. Mystic Flare flies is not going to be enough, and Gwyphon stands there and watches. It's a double edge from Lentif. Just says, get back. Cassius caught out on the fissure, Oranges comes on the earth line, time lapse is there, but unfortunately time lapse in on the other side of the fissure. Lentia could choose to commit to this, but the Squirtle, he's back in the face. He's going to Ghost Bone as well as the Torrent. Torrent catches out Orange, Ghost Bone might catch out Orange as well. Oranges does take a fall, a huge amount of gold now going in favor on the radiant side. The turn around could be coming, Squirtle got caught him with the Ice Path. But he's got the Coco Rum debuff, he's able to stand his ground, but now Coco Rum has worn off. So he suddenly sobered up and realizes that everything is going to be faster than it was before. Damiel chasing down the Megalomania, but instead he's being fogged to hell, and Megalomania blinks himself out. Great jukes coming up from him. And they are actually able to hold on to their racks in terms of a golden experience. I actually would say the Radiant side came out on top of that. You see the amount of gold they get from that, 1,300 gold as well as 4,000 experience. That's from the kill over the Meepo. Looks like Cassie's Clay actually didn't die to the Sun Strike, so some cheeky plays came out from the Clay. And off the back of that, the Golden Experience is now sta stabilized, and so no longer hemorrhaging as much at Golden Experience as they were before. And signs of life are being shown, so it's a fair amount of gold going in favor of our SM just by killing the Meepo. And Meepo looks like he's going for the Sheep Stick, so it gives him a huge amount of uh, pickoff power. A single Meepo catching them out, especially if it's a main Meepo, but it's under kill attack. Oh, Damien Hill, really frustrated with Megalomania. As Ogre Magi has got 0.46 fast point now. He used to have 0.54 as well, but it's very easy to fog him out. That's the reason why you usually want to uh, start in with the Ignite to be able to stand him so that they can't fog you. But in that, in that case, it was on cooldown. Monty almost has his BKB. Once that BKB comes online, that's when SM have that window to try to take fights off Joey. Joey, they have built a fair amount of uh, physical uh, DPS now from Lenti, who is actually deciding to go for that Hard Taras, so Shiva's be damned. As well as the Invoker with the Exalt Dash. Orange actually does catch out Gwyphon. Current, unfortunately, just catches the Rift so he's able to find some gold off that. And with that kill, the Sun is threatened uh, Rex once again. The ultimates are all up, so this could potentially be a mistake from Joey if they're not able to get a great initiation. The only reason they were able to take that fight was because Megalomania is able to set up a fantastic initiation with the Blink Echo Slam. Meepo actually did kill Monty, so they no longer have to worry about the Prince Bear. Cassie's play gets pushed back with a Daphne Blast, but the Mickey's no actually able to bring down the melee racks. And Joey could actually just choose to retreat right now. Ghost Boat flies out. The Conic is actually able to dodge it. 3x multicast over Alenti. And once again, the Conic with the Sunstrike, able to pick off Cassie's Clay. 
to some 360 MLG no scopes from the Radiance the Middle Barracks. The Aglum Scepter and I don't on the Cross Hexel and Vogue is level 19. He's reached the peak of his power, at least for the next 35 minutes. At this point, he can opt to go for something like a Sheep Stick, or he could actually even decide to go for something like an Aglum Scepter, uh, sorry, a Refresher Orb to really give him some maximum of burst damage. Damn, unfortunately, the X marks Torrent Combo wasn't there, but the Mystic Flatters bring him down. And feeds a huge amount of his Regal in favor of the Staff Supports over on the Radiant side. So, Joey, they've got to be careful that they don't throw away their lead. We have a look at the fight recount. Gold actually is starting to go in favor of the Radiant side now. Damien actually caught him with the Sons as well as the Epic Challenge for Ice Blast. And I had uh, a Squirtle as well, blown apart by that. So, great plays coming out from Sidhu. Really following up on Lenti for the Origins Initiation. Could get those buyback. So, Squirtle is going to do everything he can to try to hold the line. He's going to throw out the Ghost Boys while the Torrent is trying to frame this. Monty comes and unfortunately whiffs the Chronosphere. And Lenti, caught behind the main lines, force stops himself out. Pops the Mask of Madness in shame. Starts to simply just back himself off. Right, Xbox is fun flies, as well as the Mystic Flare and the Ghost Boy, but the four stops are there. They're keeping him alive, a squad not turned into a pig. Origins comes in, and snares the pig. Fisher flies as well, blocking him. Monty, hoof stops there, catches up two. Double edge not being used yet, actually looks like it was used earlier. Squad let take a fall. So Coco run buff kept him alive for a little bit longer. Megalomani catches up Cassie's play with the aftershock. Cassie Clay pops his BKB, looks like that's actually his 7 second BKB charge. Origins throws out the Earthbound, unfortunately, Earthbound is magic based, so it doesn't penetrate the BKB. But they are still able to hold on to that Rex. Now if we have a look at the fight recap, they actually are gaining in terms of experience from this. So even though they're losing a little bit in gold, actually they actually recovered in gold from killing off the Invoker. SM are actually doing okay in terms of recovery. Lenti, quite a bit out of position, Mystic Flare being dropped, he's able to force up himself alive, to keep himself alive, force up a huge amount of work. Damiel, gets smacked up by Orange, Cassie's playing on top of the pick, Monty, comes in, no bit, um, Chronosphere available, if he had that Chronosphere, he couldn't turn the Cassie's play, time lapses, time lapses, the pooping thing goes. And Monty, stands his ground, decides to make a last stand, trying to bring down Orange, but Orange finds a triple kill. The Custom Shot flies out, catches up the Meepos, but one's gone home, and the rest of them are going to continue to threaten the racks. Lenti blinks his up forward once again, Megalomania also starts to commit. But another change with Big 2 is much more difficult to uh, found dive. In fact, I actually completely dis uh, disencouraged trying to found dive because you can throw away a huge amount of Regal. Has seen better days. The ramp is a lot bigger. The the radiance bottom tower was always the weakest tower. Fountain. Radiance bottom but barracks. Inside the plane stays smack, starts smacking down the racks. This is probably used over uh, Megalomania as well as the ancient seal being done. Not going to be enough damage. The Chaos Beetle almost brings down Griffin. EMP might actually be enough to seal this day. Ghost Boy flies as well as the 3x. Over Nectonic, but Nectonic actually gets 4 star forward, so he dodges the boat. So even though he was up in the air, 4 star keeps him alive. Damien likes to back himself off temporarily. Sunstrike cleans him up, so Nectonic doing what he does best. Why do you use the color of my origins? So they caught him with a torrent, but it's not going to be enough. And Joey taking a very commanding game number 2. So 2 0 going in favor of Joey against Laymakers. Slaymakers in this game not so radiant anymore. really does boil up to the fact that they weren't able to get their BKB on home for these early engagements. Joey, absolutely fantastic performance coming up from them, especially from uh, Megalomania with the uh, Earthshaker there. Juke plays over in the top lane against Monty, keeping himself alive for about 30 seconds, giving Lenti as well as Nikonic enough time to then come back in and to not only keep him alive but to then return the kill against Monty. So Monty, not the most impressive Chronosphere, he really wasn't able to uh, be active enough in the early stage of the game to control the tempo. But that being said, absolutely phenomenal performance coming out from Nikonic over on the Evoker as well as Lenti for the Central Warrior, really setting up the initiation. So this game really goes to show you the power of the four staff as well as the power of, these, of the uh, team that is able to initiate first. This is Joey. While they did have an incredible pickoff power, in terms of overall team fight, if SM were ever able to get that combo off, they should have been able to decisively win these engagements. You've got the Chronos Fair to set up, Following with the Mystic Flare as well as the Ghost Bow and the Torrent. The sheer amount of damage that comes out from that should be enough to be able to pick up, start a fight 3v5 or even 4v5. And that's enough for you to be able to and decisively win these engagements since uh, Joey are then forced to retreat and break off. But the advantage of Joey is the fact that they've got the Centaur Warrior, so he's able to pop Stampede so that when you see the uh, faces void, time walk forward, when you hear the noise, you press R, give your team that moment to be a split apart, might be able to prevent you from getting three or four heroes caught inside the Chronosphere. So SM, they're a very powerful team fighting lineup, but unfortunately that lineup had too many moving pieces. And so Joey were able to capitalize on that with a superior pickoff capability. They were able to use that to use, uh, continually build their pickoffs, especially with Nikonic, able to throw out the Sun Strikes across the map. And with Orange just having a fantastic start over the Meepo. And so a really good performance coming in from Joey, but once again, really does boil down to the fact that uh, SM, the supports weren't actually able to rotate very successfully compared to the supports over of 
Now, Joey, even though they didn't rotate at all, Earth Strike was there pre predominantly to ensure that Lentif didn't die. They didn't go for any rotations, but at the same time, neither did SM. So SM could have actually looked to rotate mid to try to pick off the Invoker, since the calling, especially going for cross exile Invoker, has no survivability at all. The only thing Invoker can do is try to stand his ground and turn with the Forge Spirit that calls that in tower range and maybe try to at least trade a kill. But with the Concussion Shot Agent Seal into the Fire Blast, SM really had the uh, capacity to be able to go in for these pickoff kills, especially with the Torrents coming in from uh, Squirtle, since he was actually fairly on point with those Torrents once he had that first point in X. But all in all, uh, GG well played to both teams on 49, Community Shoutcast for the UGC League. If you have enjoyed this broadcast, please do follow the channel and subscribe uh, to our YouTube. This will be where one of the five channels where we will be broadcasting the majority of the Eastern Invite, as well as the New Zealand, Australia, uh, Iron, and the North American uh, Iron Division, I'm um, 49, New Zealand uh, Shoutcaster, so I'll be covering predominantly the Eastern Invite as well as the New Zealand Australia uh, Iron Division, it's been pretty fun for tonight, we will be back in about a week since the standard game time is on Sunday at I believe 8pm AST, so about 11pm for me over in New Zealand, but otherwise that's been it, thank you for watching, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter I'm available at, at 49 Dota. otherwise that'll be it for now, have a good one.